Welcome everyone to the February uh, edition of the Inky Reading Series. We are so pleased to welcome um, three very talented fiction writers, um, as well as a, a poet who does both a little, uh, a little this and that. Um, we have on the bill tonight, Carter Sickles, um, Ellen Hagen, and um, Marco Rafala. I think I'm going to struggle over that every time now that I'm self-conscious over it and I apologize. It's fine. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank our sponsor uh, for the series, the Commonwealth Bank and Trust. And um, let's see, I think I have a few more people to let in. There they are. Okay. Um, so my name is Amy Miller. I am the executive director of Louisville Literary Arts, and I am so pleased to welcome everyone here on a very cold and icy night. I'm glad we're doing this virtually, so nobody is going to slip on some ice, uh, and stay warm and have our warm drinks or wine and enjoy an evening of, of good uh, literature. So, um, they drew straws and um, Marco decided to go first. So I will introduce Marco and uh, we will begin our evening. Um, and just in case you've just joined us, if you would please mute your microphone, uh, but you are welcome to put your video on. It's nice to have an audience to read to. Marco Ra. Rafala, right? Marco Rafala. Great. Marco Rafala is a first generation Sicilian American novelist, musician, and writer for award winning tabletop role playing games. He earned his MFA in fiction from the New School and is a co curator of the Guerrilla Lit Reading Series in New York City. Born in Middletown, Connecticut, he now lives in Brooklyn, New York. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the Bellevue Literary Review and Literary Hub. His debut novel, How Fires End, won the honorable mention in fiction for the 2020 Connecticut Book Awards. Let's all welcome Marco. Hi. Um, thank you for having me, Amy, and thanks for um, rescheduling because I was actually supposed to be there in person around this time or in March, I think, uh, last year. So of course that the pandemic had other other plans for us. Um, so I'm gonna read a section from uh, my debut novel, How Fires End. Um, How Fires End is a Sicilian American family saga inspired by my father's stories of his life in Sicily during and after the Second World War. Uh, in the novel of Vendetta and a Curse follow two families from a hillside village in World War II Sicily to an Italian American community in Connecticut in the 1980s. Um, and all you need to know before I start reading is um, it's 1986, we're in Middletown, Connecticut. The narrator is David. Um, he's the 13 year old son of a Sicilian immigrant and David and a bully named Tony got into a fight after school and their fathers um, broke up that fight. But in that heated moment, Tony's father told um, David's father that he can't hide behind that fascist forever. And so that's where we're picking it up. At home, after the fight, I shucked off my soaking wet clothes in my bedroom and changed into dry jeans and a black turtleneck sweater. Out the window, my father stood ankle deep in snow in the backyard. He had dragged the charcoal grill from the shed and was roasting store-bought peppers. My reflection overlaid the scene in the glass, black hair cut short and parted at the cowlick on the right, the twig offspring of that thick old oak. Outside, I held open a brown paper lunch bag for my father to fill. The craggy lines of his face tightened in the light from the fire. His mouth sagged to a frown. He clicked the tongs in his hand, a metronome of disappointment, and turned over a pepper. The fire spat a red spark. He pulled back his hand. See, he said, 
you have to be quick so the fire doesn't bite you. He picked up a steaming and blackened pepper with his bare hand. And you have to be strong, he said, and dropped the pepper in the bag. In the snow behind him, deep drag lines from the grill and footprints alongside them tracked back to the shed. Smooth waves of snow covered his garden beds. Months of hard work and care would make those beds flush with spinach and chard, peppers and eggplant. Everything he loved grew from the hard work of his hands in that garden. I got a couple good hits in, I lied, before you showed up. Yeah, my father said. He laughed a small laugh that made me feel small. Go inside before you catch cold. What did Tony's father mean by that fascist? My father turned the peppers on the grill. He took his time with each one, a tempo set by his tongs. Click, 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 click. Peppers sizzled, that word. It does not mean what you think it means. I inched closer to the heat to keep from shivering. So tell me, click, 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 click. The fire bit him and he shook his hand. Managgia la miseria, he cursed. See what you do? He placed his burnt thumb in his mouth and decided what to do with me. The boy who'd lied and distracted him from his work. He hung the tongs from the grill handle and motioned for me to follow him to the tarp covered wood pile by the old shed. I rolled the paper bag closed, set it down on the porch steps and traipsed through the snow after him. He'd made the shed himself from scraps of plywood and mismatched siding planks, roof felt and corrugated iron. Icicle teeth sharpened the edges of the rusted metal roof. A twist of black and copper electrical wire held the door shut. He handed me a thin stick of, card of kindling and I carped, what am I supposed to do with this? You break it. I snapped it in half. Then he collected a bundle of thin sticks and said, now these. The bundle wouldn't break. I tried again, this time against my thigh. It wouldn't even bend, no matter how I strained against it. Now you understand, my father said. He wiped his hands on the thick canvas of his work pants. Can you do it, I asked. My father pulled my knit hat down over my ears. No one can, he said. But some men, they like to fight anyway. And men like that are crazy. Better you stay away from them. Is that what you would do? Never mind what I do. He returned to the grill. His face lit and unlit by the cloven fire, moving in and out of darkness and light, as if he belonged to both. What I do, he said to the crackling flames. It was a question that clung to the air the way the smell of charcoal and smoke and sweet grilled peppers clung to my father's clothes. Later, when we moved inside, he posed the question again. We were in the kitchen, peeling roasted peppers, and I had made a mess of mine. When he finished salvaging my botched pepper, he held it up for me to see what I do, he asked. I take care of my family. Then he dropped the skinned pepper in a clear glass bowl of sliced raw garlic and olive oil. How old are you now? He asked me. Thirteen. Dio mio, he said. Almost a man you are. A few more years yet. With his towel, he cleaned the juice and seeds from the table. I was younger than you and already a man, he said, when the war came. His calloused hands trembled. He worked the last of the peppers, his eyes locked on something in the distance, something I could never quite see. Give me the wine, he said. I brought a bottle of his murky red up from the basement, pulled on the white t-shirt fabric that held the cork in place. He stopped me from pouring him a glass. Let it breathe, he said. It needs to breathe before you drink it. 
He nodded at the empty fold-away chair. His look pulled me back down into its flimsy vinyl padding. We prayed, he said, in caves. We prayed the bombs would not find us. Even as the mountain shook like one of Mount Etna's earthquakes, we prayed. And when the fighting stopped, he cocked his head to one side and tisked. They destroyed everything. He opened a can of sardines at the counter. Then he cut two slices from a loaf of crusty sesame seed bread and dropped them into the toaster. It was August, he said, moving into the story I knew well, the one he always circled back to, even now, 43 years later. So I did what I always did. I listened, and I tried to see them, who they would have been, who we all would have been if my uncles hadn't died. August, he said again, this time in Sicilian a hot day, the day my brothers wandered away from the celebration in the piazza. I had to find them. My papa wanted me to find them. And you know where I find them? Those stupid boys. He frowned, thinking about the answer. When he spoke again, he spoke in English, his voice almost a whisper. They were in the almond orchard playing with an artillery shell. I yelled at them to stop. I did. When he talked about his brothers, there was a lesson in the story, unspoken. And he told me that lesson all the time. If I wasn't careful, if I didn't listen to his every word, if I didn't watch out, I could end up dead like them. A fear like that could crush you. My father poured wine into a mason jar. He sat back down, leaned over his food, elbows on the table. He stuffed a forkful of peppers into his mouth and bit into a slice of dark toast topped with sardines. Those stupid twins, he said. He wagged a finger at me. I told you to stay at the library until I came for you. I sunk into my seats and forked green and red peppers from the bowl. The kitchen grew quiet, except for the clank of utensils against dishes and teeth. My father raised his head from his food. He pursed his lips, his brow furrowed. He drank his wine and then raised the jar to the light for me to see the rusty hues. Just a sip, he said. Go on, try. When I tried his homemade wine, I scrunched up my face. It tastes like vinegar, I said. He snorted like a horse. Few more years yet, he said. My father never talked about my mother the way he talked about his brothers. She died when I was five years old and he never mentioned her at all, so I didn't either. One day she was there, and then she wasn't, and all her belongings, all the pictures of her and of us together, they disappeared too, as if my father wanted me to forget her. It was like she never stopped disappearing. But I still had my mother's glow-in-the-dark stars on my bedroom ceiling, the stickers she and I had put there together the stars she had taught me how to read. Tell me the story again, I'd say, the one about Pisces, and I'd point at the green constellation. What are they, she'd ask, and I'd yell out, fish. How many fish, she'd say. Two fish, tied by their tails. A mother and her son transformed. They swam free from the monster typhon. Typhon sought revenge against the gods for the deaths of his serpent-footed brothers. He stood as high as the stars, a sickle-winged colossus, roaring with the heads of a hundred wild beasts. He rained down a barrage of mountains and fire on the gods, and the gods trembled before his wrath. They changed into animals, retreating in a thunderclap 
of mighty hooves. The world shuddered. Waves cut the horizon with glassy teeth, an ocean gnawing at the sky, frothing at the mouth in the pitch of Typhon's storm. All seemed lost until Minerva goaded Jupiter into fighting back. But even the king of the gods could not destroy Typhon. So Jupiter buried the monster under Mount Etna, where he still spews fire and ash into the air. In this way, a volcano was born. Sometimes my father was Typhon, fueled by an inconsolable rage for what had happened to his brothers, trapped under a mountain of rock, but still burning and angry at everyone, even me. Sometimes Tony was Typhon, a stupid beast bent on mindless destruction, always able to spot the weakness in me. But now I understood that Typhon was something else too, a secret long simmering hatred between Tony's father and mine. And my lie had banged on that secret like an unexploded shell between them. It had freed a monster not even the gods could tame. Thank you. So beautiful. I just got lost in it. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you. We will have time at the end of the reading for uh, questions. Uh, so if you can stay to the end uh, and have questions for all of our readers, um, that's the time to, to ask them. Um, in the meantime, I am going to um, add some links to the chat so that you know where to find um, each of our readers' books. I um, am supporting Louisville's independent bookstore, Carmichael's Bookstore. Um, and I noticed that you can order um, Marco's book there and it should only take a couple days to arrive and they will mail it to you or if you're local, they will even deliver it for free. So please check that out. Um, I also wanna mention that next Wednesday we have our monthly writers meetup, which is a free, a monthly event where we welcome whoever would like to join us. No um, reservations or registrations are necessary. You can bring up to 2,500 words or two poems and we'll discuss it um, in a very friendly and welcoming environment. So um, if you would like to join us, I will add that to our chat as well. Um, you can also find it on our website. Okay, so next up, we have Ellen Hagen. Ellen is a writer, performer, and educator. Her books include Crowned, Hemisphere, Watch Us Rise, a YA collaboration with Renee Watson, Blooming Fiascos, a poetry collection forthcoming from Northwestern University Press, and Reckless Glorious Girl, a middle grade novel in verse forthcoming from Bloomsbury. Ellen's poems and essays can be found on ESPNW, in the pages of Creative Nonfiction Magazine, Underwired Magazine, She Walks in Beauty. You're gonna have to help me with this one, Ellen. How do you pronounce that? Huizache. Thank you. Huizache. Oh, that's fun to say. Small Batch and Southern Sin. Ellen's performance work has been showcased at the New York International Fringe and Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival. She's the recipient of the 2013 No, okay, how do you pronounce that one too? Is it Noma? Noma, or... yeah, yeah, Noma. Okay, thank you. Noma Creative Arts Grant and received grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women and the Kentucky Governor's School for the Arts. National arts residencies include the Hopscotch House and Louisiana Arts Works, and has been on the poetry faculty at West Virginia Wesleyan in their low residency MFA program. 
Ellen is the director of the poetry and theater departments in the Dream Yard Project and directs the International Poetry Exchange Program with Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines. She co-leads the Alice Hoffman Young Writers Retreat at Adelphi University. A proud Kentucky writer, Ellen is a member of the Afrolation Poets, Conjure Women, and is co-founder of the Girls' Story Collective. She lives with her partner and daughters in New York City. Please give a warm welcome to Ellen Hagen. Thank you, thank you. This is a very warm space that you have created here, Amy, and Louisville Literary Arts feels very like a, like a homecoming and uh, a, a warm space to be a part of. So thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna read poems out of Blooming Fiascos. It's coming out on Monday. So it feels, it feels special to be celebrating it in a, in a sort of Kentucky base. I know people from all over, but in this virtual space, uh, holding Kentucky up. So I'm gonna read, uh, I'm gonna read a couple of different poems. I'll talk you know, briefly through them, but this poem is, is sort of about arriving here. It's called Because after Cheryl Boyce Taylor. Because Kentucky, country, clay, dirt, and degenerate, never been known to de-escalate, I'm a whole situation. Cause of cornbread, and don't I all the time say cornbread as if anyone's forgotten my love. Because bourbon, way a whole town can get drunk on a mood. Because Miriam Dawson Hagen and Eleanor Sfera Bazaz. Cause Aziz and old family stories, poker games round the table, New Haven and Dumont, New Jersey. Rows of corn and fat tomatoes, the flip flops I lost down the shore, ocean. Floor and plankton, backwoods and that good weed, highs and the creek bed out back. Hush puppies we'd buy with quarters pulled together, hunger. Don't you know I was wilder than you can even imagine? And I'm still loving, living, can't read old journals without cringing because Sterling and old Barton's touring distilleries in grade school. Born rowdy and wrote it far and long as I could because Aunt Tina and cousins, cousins, salt water, sand, and cracking shrimp until they peel straight from their bodies, slick and shiny. New York skyline because I was 22 when I rode in on a yellow cab from LGA with two suitcases and a whole life I was leaving behind. Sometimes you have to go far, far away to ever come back home. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to read from a couple different parts of the book. I, I, the book is really an, uh, a full of ode poems uh, about the things that are beautiful in the world and the complicated, the, the things that are complicated and that you push against. Uh, this poem is another sort of I come from. It, it, we did, I, I work at a nonprofit arts in education program and we did a test of, you know, you did like a sort of a color, what color are you? And all of my coworkers got blue and green and purple and they were very calm, soothing, gentle colors. And I got orange and the, the, the thing that the biggest, you know, for orange was violent. I was like, I'm not violent or angry. And then I was like, but maybe I am. So I, I, I pulled that from, from this. It's called Your Journey Continues. Or begins is hieroglyph of vagina. Every entry that opens is a door, is a bar full of medicine and herbs or what heals exists, no exits, a throughway hallway, all the temperate regions, each temperature or what it means to be curious, curiosity like a luck, locket, some charm or stone or gold I can wear, costume or dress in, take off and on. Sometimes I get the feeling of traveling the planet, Sometimes I want to stay directly, perfectly still. Dichotomous, branching, my axis, access, versatile, voracious. I have all the time been orange. Not violent necessarily, but not, not violent. Scars and such. I haven't lived as hard as I used to, but not to say my life is soft now. It's not. Not a day goes by that I don't see a bird or a rat crushed clear through their existence shot full on feathers and guts internalized at every crosswalk. Every day I lead the two hearts and rib cages I created inside my whole body, across carcasses and bloated condoms over dog shit endless, and people sometimes praising God or their idea of God near the children's place. On microphones and loaded sound systems, I hold their hands. The ones that grew in my womb and we passed disaster, dirt and trash and the men's homeless shelter and the new bones of buildings and people finding and ending 
Ending their highs near the bus terminal. There is no fresh shelter I've crafted around. Chosen the easy way. A journey marked with any answers or cleanliness you might choose if you were, say, a blue or a green or some color more accustomed to peace or calm. I remain unchanged. Most of me still as reckless as when I entered the world, shooting straight from my mother's holy, bloody canal. And I'm gonna read a few, a few kid poems. So I have a 10 year old and a seven year old and they are, they, you know, they're complicated the way ch children are. And so I'll read these sort of one after the other. I won't talk through these. Gates open. When an infant emerges, womb to world, soft and susceptible, their gums enter packed to the gills. Molars and molars, canines and lateral and central incisors, they arrive primed to rip and gnaw, their mouths full for the blooming, enamel encapsulating calcium and phosphate pulp and dentin cementum and membrane, all blood supply and nerve, tissue alight and alive inside their small cavernous maws. So when my youngest loses her first tooth, pulls it up, a bouquet of blood floods her lips, a crooked red smile. How adult she suddenly is, flush and gaping, an atrium inside of her. I feel teenaged, she says, my own jaw aching, a tender trench inside of me as I watch her shed and slip from one whole body into another. Miriam who was named after my grandmother, who we called Memma. How you were born ancestor, arrived sectioned from me, abdomen and what it means to be gutted. Both fists knotted, knees to chest, sometimes blood can be blessing. You already knew how to holler, how rough house outside me, how country and all of you after my own Memma, who was small and subdued docile who bore nine children and lost two, swam barefoot in rivers, made skillet fried cornbread that made me weep when she left, her ghosted body re-arriving through mine. Origin storied from uterus to crib, we named you knowing. Miriam, meaning bitter or rebellious, meaning strong waters, riverbeds, banks, and what the tides could merge, re-emerge, named you for her. So when you, smallest Miriam, cling to the neck of my father, who was my mamma's oldest and most beloved, and when you say love cradled in his arms, we know death is only a smallest exhale, a transformation from one set of lungs to another, how much it takes to love the smallest bodies outside of yours, or what it means to cradle distance, or when you wake in your bed, I wake in mine, us all the time linked. When there you are, all I know of home, walking away from me. To 3.47 a.m., when your youngest throws up in her bed. By God, you think, and plunge your hand towards her sheets while your husband whispers, why would you touch it? Footsie, pajama-bodied shiver, she plunges her all at you. You hold the vomit towards God, the capital one this time, and curse fuck and loud, God, God damn it. And your oldest peeks awake, says, can we wake now? How's about a movie? How's about we hold here on the rug, cuddle close, because it's 3.52 a.m. now, and the cold's keeping outside, and the hot water's running, and every need of every want keeps on getting met, my God. Thank the bodies and the way they dispel. Thank the expanding of each lung and how we all sometimes heed towards daylight. Thank daylight too, and electricity, and the astounding capacity of luck that leaves you weeping into morning. Uh, I'm gonna read, a, um, thank you. I, I feel the energy, I feel it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read a, a, a poem that I feel like it, 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 it's sandwiched here between these two poems. It always feels like, I don't know if these feel right, but I, I feel like I read it like this the other day and I, I, like, the, I like the balance of it. Uh, this, is, this is for anybody who made it through middle school. Just shout out if you made it through middle school, 
you really, you can, you just, it's all, you're all good from there. Maybe not all good, but you're, you're better shape. shape. Uh, this is for a particular kid who said this in middle school and my response, and also the idea of raising daughters in a world where they can respond with this. On hearing in middle school that a pussy smells like fish. How I wish I'd said, yes, I'm a saline marinade. We all are. My pussy is an avalanche of salt, tastes all mermaid-like and alkaline, brine flavored. I'm savory sodium chloride, oceanic to the tongue, relish the zest of my fresh brackish flesh. I'm all surf water's savory smack. I can sink you with my sapidity, hook and net, bait you with my relished tang. My composition is compulsory, a soluble stimulus that your seventh grade self can't contain. You think you're so cute with what you imagine to be slant, put down punishment, how you lopped our sexuality down with one slight sneering snub. Suppression in the form of snide, how even then I imagined it compliment knowing I'd find someone to long for my pungent delectability. Went to sleep secure that either way, I loved the savorous, scrumptious sea that lived inside of me. And then I'm reading this one. This is, a, this is, a, this is another grandma poem. That's why it feels a little. So I'll read this one and then I'll close. Uh, this is for my, this is for my memo and, and who she was and how she showed up in the world and taught me everything. Miriam Dawson Hagen. You skillet sizzler woman, grease eyed poppin' hot. You stove chanter, apron wearer, cornbread slayer, knife wielder, waist shaker. You witchy kitchen woman of coven and craft. You palm swatter, shift slinger, corn boiler, late stayer, crossword doer, milk drinker, country fied, sweet spot haver, arms plenty, hand ringer. You stuffing wizard, veggie chopper, spin winner, potato skinner, lard user, slim sister, oven runner. You spatula wheel. Builder, casserole baker, butter to his bread. You tall tale teller, turkey dresser, sous chef, shit talker. You exalted sweet tea mixer, fried egg wonder, majestic mama to nine bodies. You grand grander, show stunner all the time. I miss you. And I'll close with this poem that I wrote about global warming, but it absolutely feels like it could have been written about the pandemic too. <laughs> so what warms you most? And thank you again. When I stay up past midnight reading about the globe and it's hot, 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 hotness, I do not weep or bellow into the polluted night sky. But do I breathe in that glorious exhaust? Yes. Do I sleep huddled in a kind of terrific fear? Sure. Do I wake again in the morning all the time before the alarm now every day, ready, 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 ready. My anxiety close and comfortable. I do say yes. I do not pray, but I do wear a mazonite around my neck like a locket or prayer. I do not scare easily. And so I barrel through, ride the train into the nightmare I keep on reading about. Hug the people I love most. Open my home, invite everyone over. Wine and chocolate, and will you sit a spell? And will you dance until you sweat through your underwear? And will you kiss the base of my throat until it opens? A splay of wings riding the shotgun of my love. I will love, 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 love. Thank you. That was so wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, and speaking of, I'm going to put the link to uh, purchase Blooming Fiascos and Reckless Glorious Girl in the chat through Carmichael's. Um, that was amazing. Yes, fire, total fire. Um, Ellen's gonna be teaching a workshop for us. Um, Let's see, I know I have it on my list of things to tell you about. Uh, let's see, February 23rd. Um, <clears throat> you can learn more and register at this link. And um, the topic is mindful writing. Um, Ellen, do you have anything that you wanna add to what the class is gonna be about? 
Sure, I was just going to say it's going to be a very a big generative writing uh, session. So so bring paper pens. We're going to do a lot of free writing and getting out of our editor mind and, and sharing that way. So it'll be if you're if you're looking to create some more work, that'll be a perfect place. Great. Thank you so much. And someone asked um, about our website and I put the registration um, link in the chat for uh, the workshop, but the beginning of that is our, our website, louisvilleliteraryarts.org, okay? Um, so I hope to see some of you at Ellen's workshop. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, our last reader tonight is at the top of my list, Carter Sickles. He's the author of the novel, The Prettiest Star, forthcoming from Hub City Press. Well, that was in 2020. Is it out now, Carter? Yes, yeah, it is. Okay, great, great. Um, his debut novel, The Evening Hour uh, from Bloomsbury was an Oregon Book Award finalist and a Lambda Literary Award finalist. It was, it was also adapted into a feature film that premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. His essays and fiction have appeared in a variety of publications, including The Atlantic, Oxford American, Poets and Writers, BuzzFeed, Guernica, Catapult, and the Bellevue Literary Review. Carter's the recipient of the 2013 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Award and earned fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Sewanee Writers Conference, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the McDowell Colony. He is an assistant professor of English at Eastern Kentucky University. Let's all welcome Carter Sickles. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy, for inviting me and yeah, rescheduling. I think we were supposed to do this long before the, the pandemic. So the book did come out since then. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. And it was just incredible to hear Ellen and Marco um, read. I loved both of the, all of that. So thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to read from my novel, The Prettiest Star. And um, like Marco's book, my novel is also set in 1986. And uh, the novel follows Brian Jackson, and he's a young uh, gay man who's been diagnosed with HIV, and he's been living in New York um, since he was 18. He's now 24, and his boyfriend and many of his friends have um, died of AIDS. And he goes back to the small town where he grew up in Appalachia, Ohio. And when he comes back home, his parents um, insist on trying to keep his sexuality and his HIV status a secret. And this secrecy and shame weighs on Brian and on the family and rumors start to spread. Um, and the family is harassed. And it's really a book about the shame and silence and I think about family and home. And it there's three um, narrators and I'm gonna read from two of them today, just briefly. I'm gonna read from Jess's point of view and Jess is his younger sister. Um, and I'll read a little bit from Brian's point of view. So Jess is 14 years old and she hasn't seen her brother uh, since she was eight. And she doesn't really know why he left or why he's come back. Um, the family keeps all of this sort of a secret from her. I think uh, the only thing you need to know if this chapter is, um, or the section is that she, kind of has this obsession for whales. And uh, this is at the end of her first chapter in the novel. So it's right when Brian um, comes back. Killer whales use echolocation to communicate. They call out and the time an echo takes to come back to them tells them how far away an object is. The echoes help them to navigate and hunt and find each other. Echolocation is like a sixth sense. When I was little, I used to think that Brian and I could communicate telepathically, like the brother and sister in the movie Escape to Witch Mountain. I believed I could send him my thoughts like whale signals, and he would hear them. I was just a dumb kid. At night, after I said my prayers, I would close my eyes and listen to the pulsing of the dark, but I never heard any voice, never received any message. I'm in my room with the door cracked, Duran Duran on the boombox volume turned low, so I can still hear my mother moving around in the kitchen, putting away dishes, making herself a cup of hot tea. My father is out in the garage. We're hiding from each other, waiting. The house smells like the pot roast we had for supper. 
hot soft potatoes melting between my teeth, stringy beef like veins. I could only eat a few bites. I stare at myself in the mirror. I don't look anything like Brian. I'm plain faced with scattered freckles across my nose, boring brown hair, boring brown eyes. I pull my hair back in a ponytail, then take it out again and the rugged in, ragged ends fall around my shoulders. My body looks soft and flat and weird. I've changed three times already. I'm wearing my only pa pair of Jordache jeans, a bright pink t-shirt and my Reeboks, the coolest clothes I own. I don't look cool. A muffler rumbles underneath the music, Gus's truck. I thought we'd all go to meet Brian at the bus stop, but my mother said Brian didn't want a big to do. From downstairs, Sadie barks, I count to three, and then I go. I'm the first one at the door. I stand still, watch the knob turn, like I'm one of those dumb girls in a horror movie, stuck in my tracks. Sadie is barking, wagging her tail. Gus steps in first. Rain trickles down the bill of his Chester Eagles hat and slides down his jacket. He wipes his boots on the welcome mat. He is carrying a big lime green duffel bag. Hey, Jess, he says. The door swings wider and a man walks in, his face shadowed by a blue hooded sweatshirt. He's wearing a jean jacket and black jeans and Nikes with a red swoosh. He's wearing, he's wearing a jean jacket and black jeans. Oh, let's try that. Nikes with a red swoosh. He pulls down the hood. For a second, I don't think it's him. He's skinnier than I remember and looks old, a grown up. His hair isn't as blonde as it used to be. He wears it short on the sides and on top longer in the back. His teeth are the color of tobacco juice and his raggedy lips look dry and chapped. Stubble on his chin. He reminds me of the pictures I've seen of drug addicts. Maybe he's a junkie. Jess, he says, and his voice is the same as deja vu hearing him talk. You've gotten so old. What are you, like 30 now? 14, I say. He sets down a small suitcase and stands close enough to hug me but doesn't keeps his bony hands at his sides and I don't make a move toward him either. I don't know him and feel shy. Sadie whines at his feet, pushes her muzzle into his legs and he crouches down and digs his knobby fingers into her fur. You got old too, Sadie, Brian says. When he stands, I see a little gold hoop in his right ear, delicate, the shape of a fingernail. I can't remember which is the bad one to have pierced, right or left, gay or straight. The air shifts, thins out. It isn't just the three of us anymore. My father moves slowly up the stairs and my mother comes out of the kitchen. They stand next to me about three free feet from Brian. Big Gus tries to scrunch himself in the corner of the doorway, tucking his fat chin like he doesn't want anyone to see him. You must be hungry, my mother says. Run into any flooding? Asks my father. Six years he's been gone and this is how they greet him, like he just went out to the store for cigarettes. We crowd in close, no one touching. My father looks at the grease rag in his hand like he has no idea how it got there and balls it up and stuffs it in his hip pocket. Glad you made it okay, he says. He takes a step forward, standing a head taller than Brian and clamps his hand on Brian's shoulder. Just as quickly as he touches him, my father reaches his hand back, but it's enough. Him touching Brian like that seems to break something in my mother, like she has just realized who this is. And she lets loose a quiet sigh and goes to him with open arms. Brian, taller by a few inches, keeps his head lifted, looking behind her at the wall. My mother stands with her back straight and her arms around him, holding him, but not uncomfortable, the way boys are when they slow dance, all stiff. No boy has ever asked me to dance, but in gym class last year, Old Miss Prescott put us in pairs and made us learn the waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three. Where's Mama? Brian asks, stepping back from our mother. We decided to wait and tell her tomorrow, she says, so she'll be surprised. Brian's disappointed. I was expecting to see her. Gus says he has to hit the road and slaps my brother on the back. I don't want Gus to go. His big soft presence takes away some of the weirdness in the room. The gold beam of headlights drizzles through the windows as Gus backs out of the driveway. Then it's quiet again, all of us still and standing in the same place until Brian walks around us and goes into the living room. He looks up and down and around. Nothing's changed, he says. I've got a pot roast warming in the crock pot, my mother says. 
Brian sits at the table and our mother dishes an enormous helping of pot roast into a bowl and sets it in front of him. All of us in the kitchen together for the first time in six years. My parents are trying to make conversation and act like this is normal. The light over the stove gives off a yellow glow. We are in a dream, the three of us standing here watching him eat, the rain falling, the air heavy and fragile, like at a funeral. And I guess that's what it is in a way, because I think just for a split second that my brother has come back home to die. And then I'm, I'm gonna switch to Brian's, thank you. I'm gonna switch to Brian's um, section and I'm just gonna read two very brief sections from his point of view. This is about a third of the way through the novel. And um, Brian uh, is sort of this, um, amateur artist. And when he lived in New York, um, you know, he lived in the East Village, he had a video camera, which are becoming popular in 1986. So he brings this video camera home and he records himself um, reading or speaking to the camera in these monologues. So his sections are sort of set apart in that way. So it's sort of these video diaries. Um, and Sean was his boyfriend. And then Mamaw is going to come into one of these scenes. June 9th, 1986. Sean told me to document everything, the good and bad. He was scared our lives would be forgotten. When he gave me my first camcorder, I didn't know what to do with it. It was a hefty, bulky thing he got from a dying friend who was giving away all his possessions. At first, I just recorded Sean making funny faces or Annie telling me about her latest lady crush. Then I started to fool around, teaching myself how to take different kinds of shots about lighting and editing, rewind, pause, record, like making a mixtape. I screwed up all the time and still do. I'll forget to change out the tape and record over my footage or I won't have leave enough, I won't have enough tapes with me to last through the shoot. But still, I found something I was pretty good at or could be good at. I started thinking about art school, thinking I had a future. A lot of the videos I made in New York were documentation of my friends just living their lives, talking, kissing, dancing, or flipping off the camera, always a favorite move. Footage from clubs and bars, drag queen sashaying down the street, glitter, rainbows, feathers. Nobody wanted to talk about AIDS or death, and I was relieved. I wanted to capture the joy, the life. But Sean, he wanted me to document the harder stuff, even wanted me to record him in the hospital dying. I couldn't do it. I didn't understand then, but I think I do now. The world is ignoring us. We've got to document, even if it's just me talking to the camera in my parents' basement. At least I'm here, a face, a voice. The world wants to silence and disappear us. But here I am, look at me. And then just this last um, scene, which is um, Brian again. June 27th, 1986. Today I was watching TV with my grandmother and Tammy Faye Baker was on singing about Jesus and Mama looked at me. Honey, even if you don't go to church, God will listen to your prayers, she says. Good Lord, was she telling me to get right with God? Does she worry I'm heading to hell? Tammy Faye doesn't seem to believe in a punishing kind of God. And I don't think my grandmother does either. As Tammy Faye blinked her mascara thick lashes, I was reminded of drag queens I knew in New York. I wouldn't mind going to church with Tammy Faye, I said, especially if she'd let me do her makeup. Mamaw giggled. Big alligator tears started to run down Tammy Faye's glittery pink cheeks. Oh, there she goes. Anything can set her off, Mamaw said. When I was little on Avon nights, we'd sit at the table and Mama would make me lists of what she'd sold and what she needed to reorder. I'd help reorganize everything, lining up mascara wands, tubes of lipstick, flat pressed squares of eyeshadow, moisturizer that smelled like flowers, eye cream. I loved the dark green bottles of perfume, the elegant gold cases of rouge. My grandmother didn't care if my hands fluttered. She asked my opinions. She trusted my taste. I think Mama would love to see a drag queen. Sometimes I'd help my friends with their makeup, but I only did drag a couple of times myself. I never performed or went out in the public, didn't have the nerve or courage. But still, when I sat in front of the mirror and brushed on blush and eyeshadow, glued on eyelashes, I felt a wild shock of delight. Boys came to me because I had the right touch. 
A few of them are dead, others sick, others infected. They were thrilled to be wearing makeup and sparkling gowns and wings and to be free from their father's disappointment and shame. They were so beautiful. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carter. That was beautiful. Let's uh, give a warm. Yes, I'm seeing. I'm seeing the emotions. Yeah. Thank you. That was a wonderful reading. Um, and I'm going to put um, the details for how to purchase Carter's book in the chat. There you go. Um, and Carter will be teaching a workshop for us this weekend on the art of setting in fiction. I wonder if you could tell people a little bit about that workshop, Carter? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're going to talk about place and how place informs um, short story or novel. We'll look at some examples, but it's going to be a lot of writing as well. So it's good if you want to generate new writing, but it's also good if you're working on a short story or novel or something else that you want to to just develop um, during our workshop. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm putting the link to register in the chat. It's at one o'clock um, Eastern time this Saturday. And I think it's gonna be a great workshop. So we have time now uh, to take some of your questions. Um, anyone from the audience have a question for um, all or one of our our readers this evening, you can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can uh, put it in the chat. It looks like Sarah has uh, one in the chat that I will read, unless you want to read it, Sarah. No? Okay. Ellen, you have a strong sense of rhythm in your poems as you read them aloud. How do you adjust your rhythm to meet the needs of different forms and subjects? Does it come as you write? Or does, does it find you before the poem? Yeah, thank you. Th uh, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly how it arrives. I think I was just talking about this, the difference between dialogue and, and poetry, you know, like there's this, you, I, I like to read things out loud. So the, the joy of the language together. And sometimes I write stuff and I'm like, I don't know if I can actually say that out loud without stumbling over the, the words, but I like, I like the explosive sounds next to each other. So I don't know. I think it's it's a little bit of play and experiment in poetry. And I think sometimes dialogue is I'm doing trying the same thing. Like how do you energize the language or how do you find that, you know, what what makes language or words next to each other explode? So I don't know. I think it's it's a little bit of experimentation. Uh, and then trying to fit the the poem to match that a little bit. Yeah. I'm not sure if that answered it, but so I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I was really impressed with the number of S sound alliterations in your middle school poem. That was so impressive. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, um, just because there's so much synchronicity in all of the readings tonight, um, there was a lot of homecomings or, or feelings of, of um, being home while away. Um, and there were also, there were a lot of food scenes in your works. Um, and then 1986 came up twice. Um, so I don't, I don't know where you all come uh, up with your ideas, but I'm wondering if you could each talk a little bit about what inspired your, the work that you read um, because I'm really curious in origins. Uh, I can start and then, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I wanted to write, well, I had, um, I grew up in the eighties in a small town in Ohio and, um, I remember watching this uh, episode of Oprah about this man in um, West Virginia who was gay and uh, HIV positive and he was kicked out of the swimming pool, um, kicked out of the pool, the pool was drained. And, and it was really, uh, I didn't understand at the time because I was, was young, but it left such an impression on me, I think. And I understood all the sort of shame around that. Um, 
at, as I was sort of coming out, you know, much later. And, um, and I looked it up and there indeed was a show. I wondered if I still remembered it. And it's, it's really hard to watch. You can catch clips of it online, but um, the audience is vitriolic. And, you know, one man stands up and says, uh, every, you know, AIDS is nature's way of eradicating gay men. And the entire audience stands up and claps like as this man is sitting on stage. So I wanted to write about um, the AIDS crisis and epidemic of the 80s and 90s, but look at it kind of through the lens of a small town instead of um, an urban setting and look at what happened when um, men, uh, gay men returned to these small towns and, and tell that kind of um, family story um, and homecoming story. Thank you. That's really powerful. I, I grew up in the 80s too. And I thought that your um, your descriptions were so spot on. Um, I could see the Jordache jeans in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. And um, and those shows were so, so, um, so painful to watch. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, thank, thank you for you. writing about that. Um, what about you, Marco? What You said that you were talking or you were writing about your father's experience. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, sure. So um, I uh, I was also a teenager in the eighties, um, and I I grew up in a uh, close knit Sicilian American community in Middletown, um, and all of the uh, Sicilian Americans that are in Middletown. A, 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 a large majority of them all come from the same village in Sicily, um, which is just sort of an interesting side note. But um, so I grew up listening to all of these stories uh, from my father. He was like seven years old during the Allied invasion of Sicily, and and, and Melilli, which is where he was, uh, where he grew up, was um, bombarded by the Allies, so it was pulverized. Um, and then when the Italians switched sides, the Germans. Uh, bombarded the village because there were British soldiers there. Um, so I grew up sort of soaking up all of these um, stories that my father would tell me uh, from a very young age and, and also his brother and, and just other older people in the, in the community who experienced that same childhood war trauma um, uh, during the Second World War. Um, but the, the idea of writing the novel didn't occur to me until I went to Sicily with my father in 2001. Um, and uh, being there and, um, excuse me, where is this emotion coming from? Um, being there and just seeing the place where, that he talked about, uh, that he has such a, a complicated relationship with because of that, uh, that trauma. Um, when we came when we came back from that trip is where I um, I started writing and, and exploring um, all of those feelings and the and the drama and and also I I I found um, the answer to a question that had never occurred to me before which is what is a Sicilian American story that's not a mobster story that's not about the mafia that's not about criminals you know and and I found that it was it was this story it was a story about regular people who um, were so affected by the war and, and how they um, came to the United States to, to try to rebuild their lives. Thank you so much. Um, you do have a question here uh, in the chat. Um, your voice is so honest, Marco, and tender. As a first generation American, how do you balance being open about your experience while also protecting, honoring your family and community? Um, well, thank you, first of all. Um, it is definitely something that I, I worried about and pulled a lot of hair out. I think I pulled it all out. Um, you know, it took me about 10 years to write the book and I, I always, um, and. I always had my my father to lean on if I had a question or and he he knew what I was doing and he didn't mind um, and he was always open with um, telling me all of these uh, answering all of my questions. Um, I'm not I don't know what the answer is because I wasn't I, I'm not 
I mean, so far I haven't upset anyone in my family. Um, so I, I guess I straddled that balance very you know, pretty well, but I did change a lot of um, details and um, you know, there are no names. I didn't use any names of, of actual family members in the book. Thank you. And Ellen, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the origins of your poetry collection and you have a follow-up question from D Flow. Um, your voice is so deeply rooted in the bluegrass. How has this affected your life as an artist, community member in New York? Yeah, yeah, that was a beautiful answer, Marco, too. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think the origin of this work now is definitely in, in raising children in, in, in the city and also raising kids in a place that I was not raised in. You know, I grew up in, in Bardstown, Kentucky, a very small town in Kentucky and, and think about in the 80s. <laughs> so the, really the 80s has a thread between us. Uh, and just thinking about, you know, I, I've been really, uh, especially the poem started on walks to school and thinking about as you raise, and I don't think it has to do with you just with children, but if you're, if you're helping to raise or, or, you know, mentor anybody, what happens is they walk outside of your, you know, you, and you don't know what they're going to do. What are they going to say? What's going to happen? And I remember thinking about like, you're, you're building this body that, that shakes loose from yours. And so I, I don't, I, I think those poems came from thinking of um, mothering and also, um, you know, I'm partly mother and partly, you know, myself even after that. So it's like figuring out what your identity is outside of being a mother and uh, cracking those things open and also bucking against the idea that writing about motherhood or anything is sentimental. I just thought, well, let's just write about whatever. I just, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna follow that. Um, and then the Kentucky uh, part is, yeah, I think Kentucky is I feel like Kentucky stays with me always. I, you know, I did everything I could to get out of Kentucky. And then I'll, as I'm out of it, I'm doing everything I can to get back to Kentucky. I mean, which I always was trying to do, you know? So I think it's a push and pull of loving a place you come from and raging against it, which I did both of for a long time. Yeah. That is, that's so relatable. Um, having been there myself, but I came home. Um, so I just want to, unless someone else has another question, I think we're ready to wrap up. And I wanted to thank all three of you so much for coming and reading your new works. And I hope that um, everyone will rush out and get the books or order them from Carmichael's. Um, I also want to share that we have two free workshops um, that are being uh, co-sponsored by the University of Louisville and the Kentucky Derby Museum. These are free poetry derby workshops. Um, one is taught by poet uh, Christina Ernie and that is on February 20th. And Makalani Bondale is teaching the one on February 25th. Putting that information in the chat. And um, for our March reading on the 11th of March, we will be featuring Frank X Walker, Makalani Bondale and Britton Shirley, three fantastic, amazing Kentucky authors. I hope that you will join us. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next month. Yay, that was fantastic. <laughs> I loved all of your work so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming. And I, I have a small honoraria that I will send to all of you with the various ways that we already talked about. So I, I wish it could be more, but um, token of our appreciation. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a beautiful reading. Amazing yeah. for you all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck with your new books. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. And I'll see um, Ellen and Carter soon at workshop. Great. Bye. Have a good night. Have a good night.